Can I start by thanking the Society very much for inviting me and my colleagues, um, Eleanor and um, Adrian, to present you this afternoon some preliminary results from the uh, project funded by the HRC, which, um, as our president has just said, um, seeks to understand better the deposition of hordes of coins and other precious metal objects <coughs> in the Age and Roman Britain. I'll discuss the structure of the project in a minute, but first I'd like to um, set the scene and explain why we think there's a need for this research. <coughs> Over 4,600 coin hordes um, are known from Britain, uh, dating from about 120 or 150 BC to 1937, and more than half of them date to the 370 years of the Roman period in Britain while a further 336 belong to the Iron Age, and well, this it shows a summary by broad period. The questions we are trying to ask in this project is why are so many hordes known from this relatively short period, and what do they tell us about Britain in the Iron Age and Roman periods? And we have a particular focus on studying the context of these hordes. As there's been a tendency to study the hordes as artefacts in their own right, while paying relatively little attention, much less attention to the context of their burial, and as someone who's been responsible for doing that, I, I think I can say that with some uh, confidence. Um, and I hope that through this project we will redress um, that balance. Of course, um, uh, to simplify things grossly, the, in the Iron Age, the conventional explanation has been that the hordes were buried for ritual purposes, while in the Roman period um, uh, it's been assumed that they've been buried because of a perceived external or internal threat, although in the last um, generation or so um, there have been increasing voices who've suggested that we might be looking for other reasons behind the position in the Roman period. But um, can we uh, develop a more nuanced model of hoarding, and in particular, can we learn more from studying the transition between the Iron Age and Roman periods? The time is ripe for this research because the rate of <coughs> discovery and recording of hoards has grown enormously in recent years. This chart looks at the date of the first record of hoards of Roman coins from the earliest records um, in the 15th century AD here, uh, through to 2010 here. And the chart is showing the numbers of coin hoards reported per annum um, over that time span. Uh, <coughs> we've been able to um, base ourselves on the great corpus of Roman coin hoards from Britain, uh, which was um, by Anne Robertson, which was published in 2000, which contained details of just under 2,000 hoards. Um, but there are now um, some um, 800 new discoveries to add to that number. And you can see that there's a gradual increase um, in the uh, uh, numbers of hordes reported through the um, 17th, 18th, um, and 19th centuries. Um, and then um, actually a, f a slight falling off uh, in the um, 20th century, particularly in the um, period of the Second World War. Um, but then um, an increase, um, at, which coincides with the advent of metal detecting in the early 1970s. <coughs> and another one with the introduction of the Treasure Act in 1997, which is about here. But the steepest increase of all has taken place um, in the last uh, 10 years with the development um, of a network of fines liaison officers through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So, our evidence base has grown enormously over the last 20 years. The next chart summarizes the number of coin hoards um, uh, per annum from um, the Iron Age through to um, just before the Second World War, 1937. And here we have um, the Roman period in, the, in this zone here. Um, uh, and you can see a very great peak in the third century AD and then again at the very end of the 4th century AD. And the only other period that looks remotely like that is the decade of the 1640s, when we had this great spike of hoarding connected with the um, English Civil War. Of course, um, the, uh, 
The, the uh, chart only um, shows the number of hordes that have been recovered from these periods and in no re way reflects the value of these hordes, uh, which can range enormously from a handful of uh, base metal uh, coins of the 4th century AD to the 15,000 gold and silver coins and 200 items of gold and silver plate that was in the Hoxham hoard. So um, the project started uh, last summer, um, and it's a three-year uh, uh, project funded by the Arts and Humanities uh, Research Council, and is a partnership between the British Museum, uh, where I'm the principal investigator in collaboration with my colleague, um, Dr. Sam Moorhead, and the University of Leicester, with Professors Colin Hazelgrove, David Mattingly, and Jeremy Taylor. Um, Colin Hazelgrove is an expert, of course, on the Iron Age with a strong interest in Iron Age coinage, while David Mattingly um, is, uh, comes from distinguished numismatic stock, if I may say that, uh, <laughs> but has actually written um, the, the most up-to-date account of uh, Roman Britain, while Jeremy Taylor is a landscape archaeologist um, specialising in the Roman period, whose atlas of Roman rural settlement has revolutionised our understanding of that subject. So we believe that we form quite a strong team to undertake this research, and are uh, greatly strengthened by the fact that we now have three research assistants. Um, the first, uh, as um, our president mentioned, Ellen Gay, is based at the British Museum, and is compiling a database of all Roman and Iron Age hordes. We obviously need to um, also need to pay attention to the pattern of hoarding on the continent, and we're working closely with a project which has recently started in Oxford, Coin Hoards of the Roman Empire, which is tackling Roman coin hoards from the rest of the empire. And we share a common database with that project. The two other uh, research um, as associates um, are based at the University of Leicester. And the first, um, Dr. Adrian Chadwick, who will be speaking um, this evening, uh, is carrying out a GIS-based survey of find spots and a geophysical survey of selected hoards. While the um, third member of um, the team, Dr. Adam Rogers, has been appointed to um, the uh, second Leicester post and will start in July, and he'll be studying theories of the deposition of metalwork. The projects now are being complemented by a PhD student, Rachel Wilkinson, who's uh, just been appointed and will be studying Iron Age metalwork hoards from October. Our aim is to produce an online database of all Iron Age and Roman coin hoards from Britain, um, and uh, we've been very fortunate in being able to include the data on um, Iron Age um, coin hoards from uh, the uh, forthcoming catalogue which Philip de Jersey um, is planning to publish uh, through the British Numismatic Society. Our two areas of focus in the project, because we are, um, as you can imagine, have a, a great deal of data that we can potentially look at, will be the 3rd century AD, when we have this enormous spike in coin hoarding, and also the transition between the Iron Age and Roman transition. And I'll stop at this point and hand over to Dr. Eleanor Gay, who will explain her work on database. shows the uh, Froom hoard that was discovered in 2010, um, a very large hoard of over 2,500 radiates found in Somerset. You may have already heard about it. It's had quite extensive media coverage through the PAS. Uh, this was found by a metal detectorist, but um, it was perhaps a textbook situation that the metal detectorist uh, reported it straight to the fine liaison officer, who um, was then able to arrange for it to be excavated. This is uh, showing it being excavated by the archaeologist. Alan Graham. So this was really an opportunity for us to investigate one of the largest hoards from Roman Britain, in fact the largest hoard in a single container, um, in more sort of scientific circumstances than 
had um, occurred with say, the earlier finds of the Norma Bean Canetti Awards. And um, we had the opportunity to excavate this in layers. I'm not going to talk about this in more detail, but um, this led to some video evaluation and thinking about how the woods might have been buried and why they might have been buried. Well, this work was being carried out, there was some quite well-preserved textile that was found within 
in coins, which might have suggested they were wrapped in bags or separate portions. I think this is a sort of underlooked category of evidence that's been um, reported fairly frequently in the past. It's surprising when you actually look back at old records, these things are mentioned or appear in photographs which have been slightly neglected. <coughs> seems to be um, being recognised more and more and now conservation is more careful. Now people aren't just smashing the pots and sipping the coins into acid, they're actually carefully removing them in a scientific way. We did get quite remarkable results with the layering of the coins in the pot. As you can see here, the purple layer is the final layer that was um, in the top. This goes from the bottom to the top and the top part of the pot, the first three layers was uh, the place where the later coins were found. They're tipping over outside the pot into the surrounding area. They're almost exclusively in these layers and not spread out throughout it, which does seem to suggest that the hoard has built up over a period of time, which again um, means that we need to reassess the idea that hoards were put in the ground in an emergency in a hurry all in one go. So what we're doing first of all is um, a data collection exercise. <coughs> database in which we're putting in all the hoards from Robertson's 2000 work that Roger just mentioned, containing about 1,900 known hoards. This is really a remarkable piece of work. It's a very comprehensive analysis of all the uh, local museum collections and county journals and forms the basic corpus of what we have today. And although some of these accounts are early, they still have quite a remarkable amount of contextual information that um, can be gleaned from them. But to this can be added today uh, regional studies, for example, work done in West of England by David Shotter, the work of uh, Peter Guest and Nick Wells in Wales, and Sam Moorhead's work in Wiltshire, and have also enhanced the um, known corpus of hordes from these particular areas. But perhaps more significantly, the new um, treasure cases that have come through the British Museum since um, the Treasure Act began, no, the recent Treasure Act. This uh, constitutes at least 600 separate hordes. They're increasing by a rate of about 50 new hordes a year. And on top of that, there are also addenda to existing hoards where more coins have been found. I'm very fortunate to be able to add to this the uh, Corpus of Iron Age hoards compiled by Philip de Jersey, uh, again from British Museum treasure records and other sources such as the CCI data. It's just a, a brief um, graph of about 1,000 hoards that we have in the database uh, completely entered, which show the um, impact of metal detecting on the that's available. I should say this is slightly skewed because I've started with the most recent hoard, so that's an obvious um, pattern there. But um, I think it just shows the uh, way that metal detecting has really changed the uh, rate at which they're coming out of the ground. Um, projects are using an access database designed by Jerome Merlatt, who's working at the Ashbury Museum. He's working for um, the Oxford um, Roman Economy Project, which is looking at uh, continental
based on the last call in list, we have other information. Also, uh, any contextual information about uh, archaeological excavation that might have been taking place um, before or after the wall was discovered. Because again, they've often been um, studied in isolation for their numismatic content, so this information hasn't really been looked at with equal weight the contents of the hoard. And we've got finally we've got a sort of grading system where we're grading each hoard um, according to numismatic uh, quality, but also to do with contextual quality of information and the accuracy of the find spot. So we can split up our data set in three different ways. Just briefly to run through some of the. Um, Contextual information to do with the wards. We have information on the containers. There's a, a nice little group of about 11 or 12 um, Iron Age hoards now uh, known to be buried in flints, which is quite interesting in itself. It does seem quite an effective method of concealment. Um, the majority of the hoards don't have containers, but those that do uh, have reported containers, uh, mainly in ceramic vessels, but often there are often more unusual containers, uh, including reported accounts from leather bags that crumbled on the side. Uh, it's very nice to collect this information and consider it, I think. There's also the phenomenon of hordes in multiple containers. Um, something I'm quite keen to disentangle is whether these are two containers being used at the same time or perhaps successive deposits um, made in the same place. We have a recent one from Dorset where we have two hordes possibly buried I don't know, about five years apart, um, according to the last coin, but they could well be contemporary deposits. The survey work we're going to do in that site should help um, us elucidate perhaps that's something to do with the circumstances of recovery. It's a nice uh, slide of the bowl used as the lid, the dog bowl used as the lid for the free board, which shows the size of the pot. A free board is an interesting case because um, the latest hoards in the coins of the board are found around the middle of the pot, so it seems <coughs> like maybe two uh, separate containers, might, or at least two, might have been amalgamated in the ground. This is something that has led um, Sam Moorhead to, to consider that the hoard was um, perhaps buried without the intention of recovery. The weight of the coins was such that you couldn't have ever removed it from the ground again. And the bottom slide just shows the Dorchester hoard. We have an interesting combination of containers, including what may have been a barrel with iron hoops. It's um, quite an uncertain description. There are two metal vessels. So perhaps there's signif something significant to the choice of containers used. And we're also collecting information on associated objects in our database because obviously it doesn't make any sense really just to consider the coins without considering um, brooches, other artifacts that might be buried alongside the coins. And we have uh, quite remarkable evidence for organic remains. Again, I think it's been neglected, and obviously in the past because of the lack of ability to preserve these things or uh, lack of interest in them. But more recently, we've seen some very well preserved organic material from hordes passing through the British Museum, such as this organic stopper from the York Ward, which looks like a collection of rags, perhaps stuffed into the mouth of the uh, dimple beaker on the top uh, left of the slide. And some uh, cereal remains are packed closely and throughout two small beakers buried in the Selby area in Yorkshire. These are very uh, small beakers, densely packed with silver coins. Um, seem to be buried at the same time as each other and perhaps might suggest some sort of uh, ritual aspect to the offering in terms of the combination of uh, grain and money together. And just to uh, show that we are also able to be able to map these hordes, this is just a very um, rough plot uh, using a Google fusion table, which is a good tool if you've ever tried it, but um, hopefully we'll get this into GIS soon and be able to look in a very more fine grained way at the landscape. So just going back to some of the research questions for the project, um, the emphasis uh, in the initial uh, beach basin project was very much on the third century. This is still something that is really key for our understanding of these hordes, because it seems that um, the state of the knowledge of the third century Roman ruins is something that seems to have been uh, slightly neglected, and we're trying to um, do a bit more of a survey and gain more understanding of this period. As, um, it does seem to be that the traditional thesis of Hordes being buried in times of uncertainty and political crisis doesn't fit very well with the archaeological evidence of what we know, that this is a fairly prosperous time and a time when there doesn't seem to be huge upheaval on the countryside. But um, we need to do more work on the baseline of our knowledge to see if this is really a true picture or just a general impression. And um, 
This leads us on to the question of why lords were buried. There are many competing um, theories about why lords were buried. And I, I'm fairly sure that we'll never know exactly why they were buried. And we were looking at a combination of factors here. In fact, I hope you've come to the conclusion it's a combination of factors, not just one. But um, we have the, the idea of discard. I mean, it's important to remember that uh, with coins that were formed in the third century, some of these coins would have been possibly even worthless at the time of burial, unless their silver content is taken. But yes, this might go hand in hand with the idea of um, wanting to uh, use an item that was not of great value in terms of making an offering or a coin that is representative coin in the ritual offering. For example, you might not use your latest coins, you might use some old coins. There's a theory of um, safekeeping and public, and there's the idea that people put things in the ground and didn't recover them. If this is the case, why do we have peaks at certain times and not at others? The idea of ritual deposition of metal work isn't something controversial in Korean history, and uh, perhaps not in Roman archaeology these days, but I think in numismatics it's still seen as um, perhaps unorthodox in terms of explaining coin wars. But I think we need to have an open mind about the role that um, ritual behaviour plays in the deposition of these cords, especially when we look at the choice of landscape locations that seem to attract um, deposition over a long period of groups of metalwork, not just coins, and coins of different periods. So just looking in a bit more detail, um, this is comparing um, site finds according to Reese's British Me with hoarding. And you can see actually in the third century they're following each other fairly closely, which may be that we are just looking at the fact that the increase in hoarding is a factor of circulation. But then there are other um, periods when hoarding seems to run at a higher level, and um, maybe that this is part of an earlier pattern of continuum. I want to just end by looking briefly at Iron Age hoards. Um, this is something we're expanding the project now to look at in terms of the transition between the Iron Age and the Roman period. The um, recent excavation of the site at Hallerton has had a really significant implication for the way we look at the Roman wars, I think. <coughs> we have um, here evidence for a successive deposition of a number of hordes. In this area here there are about 18 hordes uh, just inside the entranceway of a structure that hasn't been fully investigated. There are also hordes buried and associated with these helmet burials and with um, dog burials outside the entrance to this enclosure. Something that we were really struck by is what would happen if this was found by a metal detector and not excavated? Uh, would we be picking up the um, archaeological pattern of discrete hordes here, or would we assume that this was just as something scattered by the plough? So I think it really uh, leads us to look again at some of the earlier first century hordes from the Iron Age and Roman period, particularly where they're coming up in a pattern repeatedly over a certain amount of time over quite a wide area, do we actually have perhaps more discrete objects, um, discrete deposits, and not just one deposit that has been scattered through time? Very briefly, plotting the um, number of Iron Age coins in the Iron Age was uh, listed by Jersey Jersey by metal period, gives as you expect that the picture of the uh, changes of use of metal throughout the Iron Age, starting from potting and then the adoption of gold and then finally silver. Although this is very skewed, um, I think here this is mainly just Hallerton here alone. <laughs> but it's also important to remember this is a regional pattern, and if you plot this region, you have a very different uh, picture with uh, bronze coins coming in the late, Roman, late Iron Age period in the east of Britain, but not in other areas. And it would be interesting to investigate how this um, continues into the Roman period, if it does continue uh, with the choice of metal of certain denominations, or whether there's a complete disjuncture of the Iron Age pattern. And it's also um, important to investigate this looking at um, objects other than coins, which hopefully the uh, new um, doctoral post in Leicester will be able to do. Finally, just looking at um, Towards my uh, period, including the Iron Age. Just grouping them here uh, by what's uh, essentially Hazelgrove periods, as Philip Jersey has done, alongside the Roman wars. There is some overlap in the middle, which is not entirely possible to combine because of the difference in dating methods used. But we can see that there's um, not 
really a remarkable piece to say that the Roman conquest of Britain is a sort of more of an undulating pattern, partly um, due to the way that time dates and the end dates have been chosen with numerous types, but it just shows that there's a sort of more really a continuity in a low level of deposition over a certain amount of time. And this is slightly at odds with the way that we interpret the Roman Iron Age cause. There's a traditional um, view, as Rogers mentioned, that Iron Age whores are more accepted as a ritual deposit, but Roman whores tend to be seen in a more sort of rational way. But well, when does this change? If we have a sort of continuous background of people bearing whores, is this you know, really something that suddenly alters overnight when the Romans come in? I think not. So the question is really to look at this in a much more nuanced way and to bring in information about the landscape. So I'm just going to sort of very briefly, I, 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 um, I shall add, go through some of the data that I've been ploughing through because it's, it's been important for the project to actually assess the quality of the data that we're using. And unfortunately most of it is pretty darn poor. Um, <laughs> we're relying a lot on 19th century and early 20th century accounts where the sort of information I'm interested in, details of context, um, la even landscape, um, are often lacking. And as a general rule of thumb, if you've got a, an entry that mentions conies, forget it. Um, <laughs> you will have conies dug up a rude urn of coins in the church field. Fantastic. Um, or even you'll just get the name of the parish and that's it. So clearly, that's not very helpful. And it's interesting, what I did, what I've done initially is look at three counties as study areas. I looked at Somerset and South Yorkshire and Cambridgeshire. And there are some interesting differences. Cambridgeshire and Somerset are, hopefully as you can see, quite similar. There's a very small proportion of the data is what I call category three or four, where you can sort of identify the site location to within about 200 metres. Very rarely is it excellent where you can get it to within about 30 or 50 metres of where it was actually deposited. South Yorkshire is interestingly different. And looking at the accounts from Cambridgeshire in particular, I think it's a clear case of there being too many <coughs> antiquaries because a lot of people in Cambridge, unfortunately, were sending out people into the countryside and quite happily buying any core any coin hoard that people came across, and I think this has skewed the data to some extent. And also in Somerset, I think there were more antiquaries operating. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, so South Yorkshire has fewer hoards in, in total, but the, the actual data is proportionally better, which I certainly wouldn't have expected before I started this project. And thinking about the, the other aspect of what I'm doing, the known landscape context. As a project, we've developed these very broad landscape groups. Um, don't sort of bother with the full details, but one interesting um, trend that's emerged out of this is certainly in Somerset and South Yorkshire, and there's clearly an obvious reason for Cambridgeshire, but um, most of the hordes are coming from hill slopes, and to a lesser degree, Hill summits. And that was slightly unexpected. And there can be several reasons for that. Um, bearing a hoard on a hill, okay, you're taking it out of reach of possible arable cultivated land and possibly any intensive activities that are going around sort of settlement areas. And maybe there's a sort of innate monkey sort of idea to get it to as high ground as possible for security. And yet, on the opposite extreme, you can think that going up on the side of a hill and starting to dig a hole in the ground and burying something might attract some attention from your friends and neighbours, unless you did it in the middle of the night. 
And of course, being on top of the hill, you might be able to see those nasty Roman tax collectors coming from a, a long distance away. But nevertheless, that's potentially a surprising result. If you want to look at it in terms of possible ritual explanations, then clearly some late Iron Age and Roman shrines were situated on hilltop locations. And there's also some very interesting sort of comments in various classical sources that areas that were struck by lightning were considered sacred to Jupiter and potentially also to Mercury as well. So unfortunately the landscape context doesn't really help us answer the question of whether something might have been ritual or economic if you want to put things in those little boxes. But nevertheless it does throw up some more interesting patterns and when we look at things overall using GIS we might be able to refine this according to regions and also according to coin periods and, and look at changes in that over time. And obviously somewhere like Cambridgeshire you've, and Somerset you've also got a small number of hordes that are associated with wet places which I'll come back to in a minute. And then, as somebody who's, um, I'm not a uh, numismatist at all, I'm, I'm a, 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 a sort of pr principally a, a landscape archaeologist and somebody who's interested in depositional processes, so I'm, I'm more interested in these actual contexts and obviously some of the more recently excavated examples are, are particularly useful for that. And again, unfortunately, the majority of hordes, be it recent or past entries, they're usually found during agricultural work like ploughing, or building work, or of course more recently their metal detecting finds, which generally tend to be from the topsoil, so they're not particularly well stratified. And obviously this is particularly true of pre, particularly pre-1950s sorts of finds. And but in the post-war period, with the sort of huge rise in rescue excavation, and also with some of the, the better recorded metal detectorist finds it is possible to identify and explore more of the depositional context. And you'll get some hordes like this recent one found last year in Seton and Devon, um, where essentially the, the, the coins have been tipped into a pit. The excavators couldn't find any evidence of any containers, but I think if you look here, you might be able to see that there is this slight sort of um, interface here between the two groups of coins, which is potentially interesting, that might hint again at some kind of organic bag, maybe a linen bag or some sort of leather container. And this is one uh, I actually was, was excavating in a, a sort of salvage excavation. It was found on a construction site in the middle of Yeovil, where you had a, a pot that had been placed very snugly in a, in a pit, almost cut to fit the pot. And interestingly, that hoard was found about a metre away from a half that had some evidence for silver hammer scale. So one possible explanation for that hoard is they were going to be doing something nefarious with those hoards and potentially melting them down and making a, a whole load more um, forgeries from them. But again, that's, that's only supposition. And so as part of the project, we've come up with these sort of very basic categories to, to classify the hoards according to their depositional context. And I am particularly interested in these material culture associations. And you know, some of the antiquarian accounts are quite good for this. Others, even some unfortunately recently excavated examples, less so. But again, that's not an exhaustive list by any means, but those are the principal classes of artifacts that we've sort of identified. Um, there are one or two things that stray into other, but that pretty much captures most of them. Ellen has already mentioned the Shrewsbury Board with this fantastic bit of um, fabric that's been preserved partly through the corrosion products. There was this wonderful hoard found at Clapton in Gordano in um, North Somerset, which was in this leather bag, which according to this photo looks like a sort of, you know, fairly modern leather holdall. Unfortunately, of course, this was in 1922 and conservation was still in its infancy. So it now consists of a sort of nasty plastic box full of crispy little shredded bits of leather, which is most unfortunate. Um, but, but there's other hints that it was found, the bag was placed in a wooden vessel hooped with iron, which does sound like some kind of barrel. And again, associated with these 
other artefacts like brooches, and obviously you can go to the opposite extreme and find boards associated with all manner of nice shiny gold and silver things. But, but some of the other things as well, plant fibre objects, there's a wonderful board from, I think it's again from North Somerset, where you had a small pile of coins placed flat on a stone that was then surrounded by a ring of woven um, reeds and it then had another flat stone placed on top of it, sort of sealing it like that. And those kind of little windows into particular practices I find particularly interesting, although obviously everybody likes this sort of bling. <laughs> and again, this is just to give you an idea um, of these no material culture associations. I don't expect you to even see most of these tiny little blips, but I think you get the basic idea that in the vast majority of cases where there is an association with some other artefact, it's with a pot. So the coins have been put in a ceramic vessel, and the vast majority of those, it's probably something like, it's over 75%, that's just one vessel. There's a much smaller number of two-vessel hordes, and then very occasionally three-vessel hordes. And obviously these figures, some of these hordes have multiple associations. What's interesting is that most hordes have the one association with one pot. You get a much smaller number of for want of a better expression, fancy boards that seem to have lots of different material culture associations and then a, a sort of smaller number of boards sort of grading off in between. South Yorkshire, those familiar with the Iron Age and uh, Roman archaeology of South Yorkshire, uh, like myself, um, know that um, even in the Roman period, South Yorkshire people weren't entirely keen on material culture and regarded it with some suspicion. So it's no real surprise that the hordes there don't have a huge number of material culture associations. But one interesting thing which ties in with some other research, for example, going on at Southampton at the moment, is an association of, in Somerset and Cambridgeshire between coin hordes and pewter vessels in certain contexts. And again, those tend to be sort of wet contexts. So maybe here, although I know various people like um, you know, John Barrett and, and lots of other people, uh, Richard Bradley, have said that you know we can never get into the exact mindset of people in the past. We can at least get a, a hint of the social practices that led to these kind of depositional events. And there does seem to be some sort of patterning in some instances visible already coming out of some of this data. And Ellen has talked a, a bit about Froom, which is the, the project that in many respects that they find that in many respects um, sort of kicked this project off. Um, so I won't talk more about that other than to sort of, you know, state again that it was incredibly well excavated and we get a really good sense of this absolutely colossal pot being placed in a pit and filled with coins and once it was in there it certainly wasn't going to be moving anywhere. But what's more interesting to me is the landscape context um, as well as the um, silica hoard that was found uh, in the same year. There's a, a, unfortunately a poorly documented hoard that was found in the 19th century during field drainage. And that is the, the, the key two words because this is a spot on the hillside that positively oozes water. So even despite sort of 200 years of putting in field drains, um, it's still a, a pasture farm and the farmer still has a lot of problem with pooling water. It's, a, it's on a spring line. So you've got three fairly large, two of them large and very significant hordes placed on a part of the hillside commanding extensive views up and down this valley next to a series of springs. And, and this is the kind of landscape context that might, and I hasten to add it to might, might hint that it's something other than a sort of prosaic economic hoard. Maybe here we are seeing some form of ritualised explanation for the deposition, and potentially as well, um, this was considered a special place in the landscape that people were returning to again and again to fill that huge pot and keep it topped up with coins. I, I just love this photo, this, this um, turf cutter James Crane on the, the Somerset Levels in Shafwick, um, where he found these silver coins in a, a beautiful little ceramic beaker which was itself in a, a, a pewter cup 
and covered with a pewter saucer and beaker. And also, for those people familiar with Roman wells, a possible sandal found nearby. And again, there's interesting uh, links there because of all those deposits of um, Roman footwear in contexts like water holes and wells. So again, maybe we get little hints of some kind of symbolic grammar or some kind of underlying meaning to some of these deposits. And not to be outdone, his, his neighbour Percy Spiller Mullins found some coins um, uh, the next year, only six feet away. And they again had been encased in a series of interesting vessels. And not to be outdone, he was really showing off. The next year, he found, um, he found a load more, uh, including a pewter canister. And I really like that canister expression. That immediately brought to mind, even though this was in an Iron Age uh, uh, Roman context, immediately brought to mind the, the so-called bean tin from Wetwang. And uh, Melanie Giles certainly got very excited when I contacted her about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was put on someone's mantelpiece and then got sold off in a jumble sale a long, long time ago, so it's completely lost. One interesting thing about this project is, you know, <coughs> where do you draw the lines? There was a fourth place nearby which didn't have coins, but it did have a wooden vessel, it did have a pewter vessel and a bronze tankard, and you know, this again seems to be part of some sort of local depositional tradition. And so we are actually going to be looking at some of these other hoards in addition to coin hoards where context and sort of location suggest that that's a good idea. They keep on finding stuff at Shapwick. Unfortunately, that vessel was part of the group found with a rotavator. Um, don't do that because it doesn't work very well, as you can see. Um, but more recently, they found this enormous hoard of denarii on this low knoll, right on the edge of those peat areas where those other hoards were found. And subsequent geophysical survey and excavation showed that it's probably a villa complex although it's not clear if certain parts of that complex had already gone out of use by the time of the deposition of this hoard. But certainly in terms of the landscape context, this one seems to be subtly different. So although it's in the same broad area, this hoard might have slightly different sort of explanations for its, its deposition. Again, this is the kind of information we're trying to draw out. And clearly prior to sort of medieval and post-medieval drainage, the Somerset Levels was an incredibly complex landscape of sort of wet bog, alder and willow car, and inundated wet meadow. And as lots of unfortunate people have been finding out this year, very, very small differences in height can make a heck of a lot of difference when you're living in that kind of landscape. And there definitely does seem to be a tradition with the, the sort of chapel calls of feeding into that sort of older prehistoric tradition of deep of deposition in wetland places. But with the more modern sort of finds coming through, particularly from developer funded field work, we're picking up sort of hordes like these from Cambridgeshire, which was the um, well known hoard at Childerley Gate, where you had these hordes placed in a shallow pit. Again there's hints from subtle colour changes in the pit that there was actually a wooden box involved, but sadly there weren't even corrosion products of that left. But then intriguingly, particularly with some of the Cambridge sites, you get depositions of other metalwork like this Iron Town bar share, which was placed on a ditch base on the same site. So again, you're getting hints that coins might be tying in to a wider pattern of deposition. Uh, one of my favourite hoards, the Cavey Hoard, which was found by a detectorist, but sort of tucked into a natural fissure in the limestone, associated with these wonderful um, two snake bracelets, which have been reported on by Hilary Cool, and also these two um, uh, uh, bracelets here, with these uh, enormous carnelians set into them on this hinged fastening. And I, I could give a whole talk on just these bracelets alone, don't worry, I'm not going to. Um, but these, these objects seem to have very different biographies, even though they all ended up in the same hoard, which is again intriguing. And there, there's sort of six or seven hoards concentrated here along the Don Gorge and associated with this particular area of magnesium limestone. And some of these hoards seem to have been focused on 
natural rock outcrops. So again, maybe we're seeing a reaction to the natural landscape and features within it. And clearly the River Don Gorge is, is a very striking natural feature and it might have also acted as a cultural boundary in the past between some older social groups, between the Brigantes and Coralie Torby. And sort of cave, the cave area is just sort of where you're starting to come off the Magnesian limestone onto the more rolling undulating country of the Sherwood Sandstones. So again, partly the fact it's in the gorge, maybe partly the fact it's in this um, boundary or possibly lim socially liminal area, these might all be factors influencing the, the, the deposition of this particular cluster of fords in this, this part of the landscape. Uh, there's a very interesting sort of coda to this because um, this, this one uh, bracelet was purchased from Timeline Originals recently and although it's different in some respects from the two from that board, it might well have been made by exactly the same craftspeople or certainly in the same workshop, possibly in York. Um, and it's currently going through the treasure process, but it's unfortunately because of the circumstances of the hoard, it's, it's, it's just possible it's from the hoard, um, it's also just possible it's not, but it's, it's um, slightly a grey area which hopefully more research is going to be able to elucidate. And as Ellen has mentioned, the project's going to be making use of the GIS, not simply to map the locations of these hoards, but then also to critically interrogate the data, so look at what's happening in the second century, what's happening in, in, in the later third century, and breaking it down into um, sort of temporal and regional patterning, and, and also looking at those associations with material culture. And then a very small select number of sites, we're going to be doing view shed analyses and visibility studies as well. Uh, you know, we want to see what you could see from a hoard find spot, but also how visible the hoard find spot was from afar. Were they always um, buried in, in sort of quite sort of furtive, secluded places? In a lot of cases, surprisingly, it doesn't seem that that was the case, which is again interesting. Um, we are going to be tapping into some of the other data that's being produced by some ongoing research projects such as the Roman Rural Settlement Project based at Reading and also using all that PAS data and information that's come from schemes like the National Mapping Project as well and comparing them to crop marks and excavated sites. And another part of the work I'm doing at the moment is essentially trawling through um, published and unpublished site reports because it's clear that Robertson and De Jersey, their, their corpuses are, 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 are very uh, ex in inclusive, but they inevitably missed some things. And to date, I've only got about sort of halfway through this work, uh, a little over halfway, but I've, I've identified probably at least 90, maybe of just over 100 new inverted commas coin hoards, which are there buried in the literature but they've sort of fallen through the gaps. They're not on our databases. They, many of them are not on HER databases either. The HERs have some references to hordes that we don't have. And the Passcape, for example, and the National Monuments Record um, has some hordes that aren't on HER. So again, we're trying to mesh all these things together and produce what we hope will be a reasonably comprehensive database for the 21st century, which other researchers will be able to use and uh, also interrogate the data. But it is interesting how some things get forgotten. So, for example, the, the, the brilliant um, temple and villa complex and settlement complex at Bancroft and Mil Milton Keynes. There's, there's lots of records to the 1978 hoard of 4th century coins, but within that site monograph, there's a further hoard of bronze coins that were found in 1984 that seem to have not been picked up by anybody, even though they're described as a hoard in the published monograph. And then there's a group of finds which aren't described by anybody as a hoard, but it's a group of coins from within the circular shrine associated with some spear tips, a spear ferrule, and then a, a load more coins and spearheads were found immediately above this during controlled metal detecting before they did the site stripping. And these were buried with a dead pig. 
that's not a site photo of the dead pig they've found, that's from my own collection of dead animal photos, I hasten to <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't sound very nice, so I'm going to move hastily onwards. Um, yes, that didn't come out very well, but anyway. But yes, so um, again, that's, that's a very important, interesting hoard. Coins, uh, in, in some cases, uh, even more interestingly, some of these spearheads are probably uh, so-called toy spearheads, so they're miniatures that might have been made specifically for votive deposition. We're going to be doing some field work, as Eleanor has said, so there's uh, money in the AHRC um, uh, bid to do maybe 10 or possibly up to a dozen if we stretch it. Um, geophysical surveys on a select number of sites and after much discussion obviously everybody had their favourite coin hoards and good grief these people from the British Museum can bicker I tell you but anyway we finally got a short list together and, and that's now had to expand considerably beyond third century hoards so that's had to include late Iron Age hoards hoards that include both late Iron Age and early Roman coins including obviously Republican issues um, early Roman coins third century coins because we still want to keep that as a significant focus and then also some late Roman finds. So next month I'm going to be going back to Froome excitingly. They did do some geophysical survey at Froome but it was, it was very very restricted unfortunately in, in terms of what was done. So we're going to look at a much bigger area and see if that picks anything up. It might not but we might get some interesting results hopefully. And some further sites in the southwest and then come the autumn when more crops come off, we'll be doing some other areas of uh, England and uh, possibly one site in Wales as well, we'll see. But hopefully that's going to also add significantly to previously known information. And that, I think, is where I'm going to leave it. So I'd just like to thank my colleagues at the British Museum, my colleagues at University of Leicester. We'd like to thank AHRC for giving us a big pot of money. Not as big as the one in Froome, unfortunately, but still <laughs> quite nice and especially the, the many um, finds liaison officers and HER officers that have been sort of bombarding with requests for information and, and data and they've been very good and have been very, very cooperative. Um, if you need any more information about the project, please feel free to contact myself or Eleanor or please pay a visit to the, the project website which is hosted at the University of Leicester and there'll be sort of, in, in the future, there'll be blogs and things going up on there as well. Okay, thank you very much. Something at the bottom of the slope, it's going to get um, a hill wash will 
cover it even deeper and deeper and deeper. If you put it um, on the side of a, a slope um, in, in a hole, then the, the uh, soil will be eroded away, and therefore the object will, as it were, move up in the stratigraphy. Thank you. Can I ask a, a linked question, which is, I know you've said there's quite a few recent late, later Bronze Age walks in my neck of the woods coming from the top of hills. Is there a suggestion of things like sacred groves as a, as a location? Um, <coughs> Adrian Jellick showed a uh, one of his slides uh, a reference to rolls, uh, by which I think he probably meant containers. Um, because um, I'm dealing with a board from London that came out of the ground, the coins fused together as though they had been in something like a smarting packing. Um, and I wonder um, what the origin of this sort of packaging, as it were, of the coin is going to come from. Yes, um, to this observation, I just wondered about the cell board and the use of chat and whether that might Yet for that direct association, but it's an interesting idea, particularly given 
uh, reciprocal arrangements for um, that making that data available to historic environment records, which is um, the obvious place where it should sit and where, of course, um, as Adrian's been explaining, a lot of the data comes from. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Um, and on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. As um, Adrian said, everyone likes bling. <laughs> and uh, I think we've uh, very much enjoyed uh, what you, uh, the good work that you're doing. Uh, it seems to me that um, it's, uh, it's great that you're using archival material. It's thrown up again the great importance of record keeping and the quality of records as fundamental to the quality of research one is able to do. And um, you know, I'm particularly interested in what you're going to be able to do with all that GIS data, which looks extremely exciting. It looks like a lot of these questions which you've raised for us, you are hopefully going to, to answer and be able to, to publish. But it does remind us all of how very important it is that we make records for the future that really can be interrogated in a way which contributes in a meaningful way to research. So I think we all look forward very much to, to hearing more about your work as it progresses. Thank you very much indeed.